I'm not sure if uh, what the deal is, but we had some trouble with the internet last week, and we are having trouble again today. I'm not sure if the power uh, or what happened with that storm a couple weeks ago, if it messed something up, and we need to have a technician or something come out. But we are not able to re to stream the message. We will be recording it and saving it on the uh, PC back there, and then we'll be uploading it to the website. So hopefully we won't have any trouble with that, and we'll still be able to get the material and uh, be able to put it on the internet. So I said a, a moment ago that we, my, me, when I say we, I mean myself and, and Nate and Andrew, and then uh, the Dibble family, we were at the conference in Chicago this weekend. They are still there, the Dibble family that is. And um, I taught twice yesterday on the subject of Codex Sinaiticus and uh, uh, things related to that. So I did that t for two hours, and then we had to drive home. So I'm pretty tired today. So if I seem like I'm a little bit, you know, lagging or whatever, it's, it's probably related to that. But I want to continue our series of studies in 1 Corinthians. And last Sunday, we looked at uh, the second half of verse 7 and the fact of Paul as one born out of due time. And we, we looked at that and, and looked at the significance of that as far as uh, di dispensational truth is concerned and, and why the idea of due time is important. The idea that it wasn't premature, that it wasn't overdue, but it happened at exactly the, the appointed time and due time that God had and had set aside and, and, and before the world began for it to happen. And so we talked about Paul as the due time testifier of all that Christ accomplished on the cross and what that means. This morning as we look at the next verse, verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Let's just uh, have a quick word of prayer. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time that we can spend together. We pray that as we talk about Your grace this morning and the impact that grace can and should have on our lives practically on a daily basis, and we look at and explore some things related to the grace life and who we've been made in Christ, that we'll have clarity about these things, that the practicality of it would be able to impact and influence us in the details of our lives. We're grateful for the time we can spend together in your word. Amen. So Paul says in verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles. Now that's an interesting statement, okay? Because he says, go over quickly to Romans chapter, go back to Romans chapter 3. Uh, uh, 11, if you would, just quickly. Go back to Romans chapter 11. We saw last Sunday the statement that he makes in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, where he says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my what? My office. And we talked about how Paul is not arrogant, Paul is not egotistical, Paul is just simply magnifying the position that he was given by the Lord Jesus Christ as the apostle of the Gentiles. So he had a God-given apostleship. He was a God sent apostle to the Gentiles, and he's talking about that there in Romans chapter 11. But when you come back to 1 Corinthians 15, he says in verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles. Now, he just said in the previous verse that he was seen last of that Christ, or that Paul, excuse me, saw Christ as one born out of due time. And that would seem to indicate some sort of significance. And we talked about that last time. But now in verse 9 he says, For I am the least of the apostles. Then he says that I am not meet to be called an apostle. Now the word meet, notice that the word meet is not spelled M-E-A-T. It's not meat like, you know, what you're going to have for lunch or what you had for breakfast. It's meat M-E-E-T, okay? And that, that word meat is an old English word that has the idea of fitting or proper, okay? If something is meat, it's, it's fitting, it's proper, it's acceptable, it's, it's a correct use, it's that kind of an idea. So he says in verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meat. He says, I, it's not fitting, it's not really proper that I should even be called an apostle. Well, why? Because, he says, I persecuted the church of God. Now, did Paul have a wild past? Did Paul have a career before he encountered the Lord Jesus Christ, before that due time appearance of Christ on the road to Damascus, did Paul have a career before that that was in the, in the which he was an enemy of God? That he was persecuting that Jewish kingdom church? 
that he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against those people. Okay, So we need to understand some things about that. Uh, first of all, come with me back to the book of Acts. When Paul, Acts chapter 8, when Paul says there that he's not meet to be called an apostle, when he calls himself the least of the apostles, what he has in mind there is his past, his past history in that he persecuted the church of God. He tells you why he's not meet to be called an apostle. He tells you why he's the least of the apostles, and it's related to the fact that he had a past in persecuting the church of God. So the first thing we need to do is just establish historically that that's what he did, that he had a past in persecuting the church of God. Now, the, church, the phrase, the church of God, you need to understand that there's more than one church in your Bible, right? I think most of you know this. There's the church in the wilderness, right? There's the Jewish, the, the Jewish kingdom church there of, of early Acts, and then there's the church, the body of Christ, that Paul is forming today during the dispensation of grace. That God through Paul, the revelation of Christ through Paul, is in the process of building the church, the body of Christ. So just when you just because you see the word church does not automatically mean that it's referring to the church of this dispensation. There were other churches, there were other called out groups in your Bible. Okay, one of them was the one Moses led as he calls Israel out of Egypt, leads them through all that stuff. There was a church in the wilderness, the scriptures uh, say, and Paul before he encountered the due time appearance of Christ, before he encountered him on the road to Damascus, he had a career as persecuting the church of God. The church of God that he's persecuting is that Jewish kingdom church in early Acts. Look at Acts 8, verse 1. Actually, go back up to the end of chapter 7, verse 58. So Stephen is stoned in verse 57, in verse 58, and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was who? Saul. Okay? And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now look at verse 1 of chapter 8. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Was well, Saul approving of what they just did to Stephen? Okay? Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, and here it is, it's going to define it for you, the church which was where? At Jerusalem. So what church of God is he going to persecute? He's going to persecute that Jewish kingdom church, that little flock assembly, those saints who had heard the gospel of the kingdom, who had come up under the, the preaching of Christ during, during his earthly ministry. The, Peter, the preaching of Peter and the twelve that they were giving there, that testimony in, in, in the gospels in early Acts. So that is the church of God that he's going to be persecuting, this church right here, which was at Jerusalem. And then it says, and they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, okay, and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them, excuse me, men and women committed them to prison. So, was Saul of Tarsus consenting unto the death of Stephen? Was Saul of Tarsus putting and binding people in prison and, 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 and persecuting those followers of the Lord there during early Acts. Come to chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Look at verse 1. Notice what it says. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the church, excuse me, against the Lord's disciples of the Lord, I told you, I'm, I'm tired, okay, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. So that was the due time appearance of the Lord that we looked at last time. It wasn't premature, it wasn't overdue, it happened exactly at the right time. Well, what is Paul in the process of doing when that happened? He was in the process of persecuting that church. He was in the process of breathing out threatening and slaughter and wreaking havoc of those believers there that had, that had followed Christ during His earthly ministry. And in the middle of that, the due time appearance of the Lord happens to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Now come back with me, go to 1 Corinthians 15 again. So he says in verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles. 
In other words, of all of the people in your Bible that were chosen to be apostles, who is the least deserving? Paul. Okay? Then he says, and that I am not meet to be an apostle. Again, that's not M-E-A-T. That's not, you know, the steak you're going to have for lunch, meat. That's M-E-E-T. It's fitting, proper. Paul says it wasn't even fitting and proper that he should be an apostle. Why? He tells you why. Because, he says in verse 9, I persecuted the church of God. Now, let's come over and look at a few more things. Come over with me to 1 Timothy. No, I want you to go to Galatians 1 first. Go to Galatians chapter 1. So Paul is the due-time apostle. From the due-time appearance of Christ, the glorified, ascended, resurrected Christ. But he's not really meet. He's not really fitting. It's not really proper that he should be one because of his past. First, or Galatians chapter 1, look at verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? So we've talked about that a lot recently, right? That Paul received his gospel, he received his information, he received his apostleship by the direct revelation and appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look at what he says next. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. So when it says time past there, Paul's talking about his own time past, his own personal time, his own personal history, right? Did Paul in the past persecute the Jewish church? Verse 13, For you have heard of my conversation in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, and what? Wasted it. Okay? Paul was to that assembly, to that group, to that ecclesia, to that church there in early Acts. He wanted to destroy it. He wanted to snuff it out. He wanted to, he wanted to uh, you know, put it off the memory, wipe it off the memory because he thought they were blasphemers. He thought they were not real Jews because of what they believed and what they were, how they were functioning. So he persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in verse 14. In the Jews' religion above many mine own equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. Was Paul a religious Pharisee? <clears throat> Was he trying to cross every I and dot every T of the law. Okay? So he was trying to excel, advance, ascend the, the ladder of, of prestige and prominence within that nation. And one of the ways that he accomplished that was by trying to lay waste to those believers there of that church in early Acts. But look at verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His what? Grace. See, if, if you put together the idea of Paul being se- did, when, did Paul was Paul separated from his mother's womb by God Almighty for a purpose? Was he born in due time? Okay? Was, did God have a, a, a unique and distinct thing that He was going to do to and through and with the Apostle Paul? Okay? Now, How does God get around Paul's past? How is Paul able to how how is God Almighty able to use that guy? That guy who is breathing out threatening and slaughter, that guy who is seeking to lay waste, that guy who is trying to advance himself through violence and so forth, and and ascend the ladder of prestige and, and so forth within the Jewish community. How is he going to be able to use that guy? Look at what the verse says. Verse 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His what? Grace. Now come over with me. You're going to find that Paul calls himself the chief of what? Sinners. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. <laughs> So we're going to be using some of these passages uh, a few different times this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 11. And according to, the, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that He counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. 
So when Paul was on the road to Damascus, was he like raising his hand and said, ooh, 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 pick me. I want to be the apostle of the Gentiles. No. In fact, he was the leader of the opposition of the Lord in the earth at that time. Okay? He was the one that was breathing out threatening and slaughter. He was trying to lay waste and persecute and destroy the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ at that time. And so it says right there in the verse that for he for uh, for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. Paul Jesus Christ put Paul into the ministry. Paul did not volunteer, Paul did not sign up, Paul did not raise his hand and say, "Oh, I want to do it or send me or any of that sort of thing." God arrested him on the road to Damascus, interrupted his life, appeared to him, and he was never the same after that. Verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer. So Paul's testimony now, after all of this, is that he was the one that was really a what? When he's doing all that stuff in Acts 8 and Acts 9, who's the one that's really a blasphemer? Paul was. Now, he was doing it, he was persecuting those people because he thought they were what? Blasphemers. Okay? He says in verse 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained what? Mercy. Because I did it what? Ignorantly and unbelief. Would God Almighty, would the Lord Jesus Christ have been perfectly just in striking Saul of Tarsus dead on the road to Damascus for what he was doing? But he didn't. He had mercy on him. That's what it says, right? And not only did he have mercy on him, but we're going to see in a minute, he also had grace on him. You know, you can have mercy on somebody, but not necessarily deal with them in grace. Right? I mean, if somebody, if I were a judge or something like that, and, and you stood before me and you had done something wrong, I could have mercy on you in that I limited your sentence or, or something along those lines or was somehow merciful to you. But to deal with you in grace means not only am I going to be merciful, but I'm going to give you something you don't want, deserve. So here's the, here's the leader. He was a blasphemer in 13, he was a persecutor, he was injurious, but he obtained what? Mercy from God Almighty. He obtained mercy. Why? Because he did it ignorantly in what? In unbelief. Verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am what? So Paul says, in the category of being a sinner, I was the biggest sinner. I was the chief of sinners. There was nobody that did more bad stuff than who? Myself. Why? Because he was a persecutor. He was injurious. He was was doing things in a way, and he was the one that was really the blasphemer. Verse 16, how be it? For this cause I obtain what? Mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ, might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him unto life what? You understand that Saul of Tarsus is I said this last Sunday, Saul of Tarsus is face down in the Arabian sands on his way to Damascus. Does God have every right judicially to strike this man dead for what he's been doing as a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious person who's been wreaking havoc and slaughter on that church? Okay? But what does he do? Instead of dealing with them in wrath, instead of dealing with them in judgment, he deals with them in mercy and grace. He has mercy on them. He lets them up. And not only does he let them up, he lets them live, but he says, here, i got this thing I've I've set you aside from your mother's womb that I'm going to have you do this. And he begins to communicate information to Paul, and Paul is now going to not only... Paul, the chief of sinners the blasphemer, the persecutor, the injurious person is now going to be the one that he's going to use to teach the Gentiles about the riches of his grace. Okay? Come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 
We'll be back to that passage in a little bit. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles. So understand, why is he saying that? He's saying that because of all the, of all the dudes that were ever apostles, who's the least deserving? He is. He says, I'm not meet to be an apostle. Why? Because he was a persecutor. He was a blasphemer. He was injurious. He did all that stuff, right? And then he says, because I persecuted the church of God. He calls himself the chief of sinners. Okay? Understand. Paul, even though he says in verse 8, and last of all, he was seen, as me, seen of me as one born out of due time, he says in verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles, and am not me to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Of all those that he mentioned in the context of the passage, who was the least deserving? He was. And then he says in verse 10, but, contrast, but by the grace of God I am what I am. That is a loaded statement. Okay? By the grace of God, he says, I am what I am. What he is then, what he is now, he is solely on the basis of the grace of God. Okay? Now remember the verse over there in 1 Timothy that we just read, that God set a pattern in him for them which should hereafter what? Believe. So God is going to do something with this man He's going to have mercy on this man. He's going to deal with this man in his grace in a way and in a mechanism and in a manner that he hadn't dealt with anybody before that. Instead of striking him dead, instead of he lets him get up. And not only does he let him get up, but he gives him a ministry and he gives him a message and he gives him something to do that God wants him to do, that God's called him to do, that God has separated him from his mother's womb to do. So God is going to reach into this man's life. He's going to reach into the sin and the blasphemy and all the stuff that Saul of Tarsus was doing, and He's going to rescue this man by His grace and make him the great apostle of the Gentiles. And He says in verse 10, but by the grace of God I am what I am. Paul, but for the grace of God, is nothing. Nothing. He's the chief of sinners. Apart from the grace of God, he's that guy in Acts 8 and 9 who's breathing out threatening and slaughter and murder against those folks. But he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. See, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, encountered the grace of God in a way that changed him. Verse 10, <clears throat> But by the grace of God, I am what I am. But his... Now watch what he says. But His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. You see that Paul is a direct recipient of the grace of God. Directly. He says, but the grace, and the grace of God which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. What God did with Paul was not a waste. It was not vain. It was not empty. It was profitable. It was profitable for him personally, for his justification, and it was profitable unto the Lord for the ministry that Paul carried out for the Lord. Over again, Paul says, look, I'm testifying to you that which I've what? Received. He talks about the, grace, the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me for who? To you, Word. Okay, he talks like that. So, he is given something to do by God Almighty, for God Almighty, for the benefit of other people. And he's given that on the basis of grace. Verse 10, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. But what? But the grace of God which was with me. As Paul goes out to do his ministry, now that he has one, he says, look, it's not, it's not me. If it were him, it would have been that same old Saul of Tarsus guy. 
But it's not, he's not that same old Saul of Tarsus guy anymore because now what's working in him? The grace of God. The grace of God changed Saul of Tarsus into Paul the Apostle. This is not just some airy fairy thing about grace. Woohoo! Grace. No, it was a reality in this man's life that changed him, was fruitful, that, that, that manifested itself in him in such a way that he was able to carry forth the ministry that God had gave him to do. So grace here is not some theoretical concept. It's not some theological structure or some nebulous idea. It's a reality in his life. And it takes him from Saul of Tarsus, the chief of sinners, to Paul the Apostle, the Gentiles. Now, I want to show you just a couple of things. Go back to the two passages we just looked at. Go back to Galatians 1 quick. No, you want, I want to do the opposite order. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I just want to reinforce this concept to you <laughs> because it's important. 1 Timothy chapter 1 again, <clears throat> verse 12. <clears throat> and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me. Who gave Paul the ability to do it? Christ. What did he just say in 1 Corinthians 15? He said, Yet not I, but the grace of God which was what? With me. Okay, Paul is not doing, not carrying forth his apostleship in the energy of his own flesh. He is enabled by the grace of God to do this. Verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful. That's interesting. Okay. Was Paul, was Paul, even before he was saved, a faithful person? Was he faithful to do what he thought he needed to do? He was. So much so that he's, hey, well, listen, we, get, we, we haven't got enough of them. I need these papers. I need to go up and get those dudes that are up there at Damascus. So Paul is, even in his, blas even in his blasphemy and his injurious persecution, is he a faithful person to discharge what he thought he needed to do? Okay? So it tells you something about his natural character and motivation. Verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. So what, God, what, the, what Christ does is He takes that faithful guy who's faithful for the wrong thing and for the wrong reason, and He gives him something different to do by His grace and makes him faithful to the right, to the right purpose, to the right task. Verse 12, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy. Notice, notice the connection in these passages between mercy and grace. Okay? God is merciful to him so that he could deal with him in his what? In his grace. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorant and unbelief. And here's verse, so look at the next verse, verse 12. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So in verse 13, he talks about how he obtained mercy, is so that in verse 14, he can say that the grace of God was exceeding abundant. With faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe. What, so what, what God is doing through Paul by being merciful and gracious to Paul is he is, he is establishing a pattern for how he was going to deal with sinners during the dispensation of grace. How See, the, the, instead of dealing it with us in wrath, instead of coming down and smacking us around every time we do something we shouldn't, how is he going to deal with us? In grace. He saved, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should what? Boast. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His 
Mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of what? The Holy Ghost. Your salvation, my salvation, has everything to do with the mercy of God and the grace of God. Same as Saul of Tarsus. Okay? And it's, it's going to be that pattern. God is doing something with this guy on the basis of mercy and grace that is going to be a pattern. Come with me back to Galatians chapter 1. <laughs> so earlier we already looked at verses 13 and 14. Talking about Paul's past. He's persecuting the church of God and wasting it in verse 13. In verse 14 he talks about how he profited uh, above others in the Jews' religion and was more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. Now look at verse 15 again. But when it pleased God, when did it, who separated me from my mother's womb? When did it please God to do that? Well, he, he had already sort of earmarked Saul for something when he was born, right? But when did it please God to let him know about that? In Acts 9 on the road to Damascus. Okay? But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me how? Called me how? By His grace. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, He says, By the grace of God I am what I what? He says, It's not I, it's not I, it's the grace of God that was what? With me. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he talked about how he obtained mercy, and then he talked about how God dealt with him in his grace in an exceeding abundant way in the next verse. We just read it. Okay? Verse 15, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace. Now look at the next statement. To reveal His Son. Where? That doesn't say, that does not say to preach about His Son. That doesn't say to talk about His Son. It says that, through, that God was going to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ through who? Through Paul. It says to reveal His Son, not, it, He says to reveal His Son in me. That's what it says, right? To reveal His Son in me. God desired to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ in Paul. Do you know what God desires to do with all of us? He desires for all, he desires for all of us to manifest the life of Christ in our mortal what? Flesh. Come with me to 2 Corinthians. <coughs> Chapter 4. Verse 7. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You know what we are as human beings? Seriously. You know what we are? We're just dirt, man. That's it. We're dirt. The Lord, we're, yes, yeah, certainly, we're dirt bags. <laughs> For the Lord God formed man out of what? The dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became what? A living soul. When you die, if you die physically, and your soul and spirit departs your body, you go back into the ground, and as Brother Jordan says, you become a carnival for the maggots. That's what happens to you. Right? But we have this treasure in earth and what? Okay, what, what in the world is that? There's nothing so great about us. Is there anything great about our earthen vessel? No. It breaks down. It hurts you. You got to feed it. You got to clothe it. 
you got to give it water, you got all these problems with this earthen vessel. Correct? But he says, we have this, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And then he said, well, how exactly is it that we have this treasure in earthen vessels? Look at the next verse. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Really? Really? I would dare say that we're perplexed a lot. That we feel despair a lot. That we, uh, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, I can't seem to get over this. Or this, this is troubling me. Or I'm struggling with that thing over there. And I, I, I don't ever seem to be able to get free of it. It seems to have dominion and power over me. Look at what he says. We are troubled on every side, yet not what? Distress. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the die. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus Christ might be made manifest in our what? Why was Paul separated from his mother's womb and called by the grace of God in Galatians chapter one? It was for God to reveal His Son in Paul. You understand that God wants to do the same thing with you, with me, with us? He wants to manifest His life in our mortal what? Flesh. When Paul says, it's not I, but the grace of God, that was what? Paul's identifying that whatever, was, whatever he was producing, that let, go, hold your hand there and go back to chapter, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians 1. Verse 10. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, for I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I. Paul acknowledges and recognizes that the labor that was going on with him was not of him, it was not because of him, it was the grace of God what? With him. Read the rest of the verse. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was what? With me. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 10. <coughs> Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our what? Folks, one of the things that you have to understand is... Jesus Christ put His life in you if you are a believer. Okay? His life is in you. He put it there, in you. Come to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Verse 1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. Now look at verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. What's the next word? Because. So there's a reason hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad where? In our hearts. How? By the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. I understand Jeremiah 17.9. I know what Jeremiah 17, 9 says. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? you got to understand and reckon it to be so that that verse is talking about a lost man's heart. A saved man's heart has the Holy Spirit in it. It has the life of God in it. God's life was put there by God the Holy Spirit. So that means God's life is in us, which means we have the ability to manifest that life. Through our mortal what? 
His life was put in your heart. You had a heart transplant. You had a heart surgery. A spiritual thing was performed on you when God the Holy Spirit cleaned your heart out and said, I'm going to live here. Okay? I know what Jeremiah 17.9 says, but that's talking about a lost man. That's not talking about a man who possesses God the Holy Spirit. Go to, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. See, here's the reality, okay? The reality is that we get bogged down. The adversary wants to keep you bogged down in who you were. He wants to keep you... By way of illustration, he wants to keep you thinking like you're Saul of Tarsus. As the blasphemer, the sinner, the dude that can't ever do anything what? Right. Meanwhile, God the Holy Spirit through Paul is telling you that he put his life in your heart. The truth, the truth runs ahead of the way you think about the truth. I think about, I'm the, my, that's why I have to renew my what? When I renew my mind, I realize that I already have a new heart, that I already have the Spirit in my heart, that God's life is already there. And if it's there, do I have the power and the capacity to, live that, to have that be the motivating factor in my life? Not the flesh. You know, unfortunately, this flesh is still, I still got to deal with this thing, Right? Is this still like and wants what it wants? Yeah. But because I'm saved and because the Holy Spirit is in me, do I have the life of Christ in me? Come with me to where I tell you to go. Oh, yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <coughs> Look at verse 22. Well, verse 21. Now. He which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God who hath also what? Sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit where? Where does God, if you are a believer, where does God the Holy Spirit reside? He resides in your heart. Now, I will be honest with you that even as a grace believer, even as somebody that, that thinks he understood something about the grace of God, I thought for a long time that my heart was still Jeremiah 17.9. But you know what I have to do? I have to by faith accept that God the Holy Spirit lives where? In my heart. And if God the Holy Spirit lives in my heart, then is the life of Christ in me? Yes. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. Now, I kind of already did that, but look at it again. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. <coughs> but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake, for God, watch, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined where? Into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Folks, somebody went into your heart and turned the lights on. You used to have a dark, dirty, stinking heart that, that didn't even know its own mind. Now you have God's life where? In your heart. Come to Galatians 4. Galatians chapter 4, <coughs> verse 6. For because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your what? Hearts. Crying what? Now, that verse says that who's in your heart crying, Abba, Father? The Spirit of Christ. Now, when you wake up tomorrow morning, are you going to like hear that? 
When you leave here and somebody cuts you off on your way home to church, like Fred cut me off this morning. <laughs> when that happens, are you going to hear the Spirit of God which is in your heart crying, Abba, Father? So how do you know that's a reality? You know that's a reality because that verse right there and half a dozen other ones we just looked at all said so. Right? So again, the truth is racing ahead of your mind. The truth is outstripping our ability to comprehend. It's, it's out there and it's saying, this is who you are, this is who you are, this is who you are, this is what I've done. And you're back here thinking, oh, I'm just the chief of sinners. Imagine what Paul would not have accomplished if it wasn't the grace of God in him. If there wasn't the grace of God in him, Paul would have been sitting here wallowing in his past mistakes. His past failures. And whatever you think your failures are, whatever I think I'm my failures are, they're nothing compared to Paul as the chief of what? Sinners. Okay? And if God can take that guy and have mercy on him and grace and make him the apostle of the Gentiles, can he certainly do something through you and I? Okay? Now, where was I? Verse 4, verse 6. Because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of a Son into your heart, crying what? Abba, Father. Come to Ephesians chapter 3. <coughs> I'm, I'm, running, I'm running out of time, but he says in verse 16, he says, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by your Spirit. Where? In the inner man. Why in the inner man? Because that's where He's at. Your outward man is perishing, yet your inward man is renewed what? Day by day. He says verse, then He says in verse 17, that Christ may dwell where? In your heart, how? By faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ. How are you going to know the love of Christ? You're going to know the love of Christ because Christ is where? In your heart. He's in you. He's already there. Chapter 5, verse 19. Chapter 5, verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace. I'm sorry, I messed it up. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody where? Oh, I'm so glad it says that. Because if it said, you know, with my actual ability to sing, I'd be in trouble. Okay? But it's, you know that song, In My Heart There Rings a Melody? The only way that's possible is the fact that who's in your heart? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God. Chapter 6 of Ephesians, look at verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness, in singleness of your heart as unto who? See, it's a heart issue. But see, if, think about if you think that you're still dirty, if you think that you're still under condemnation, either because you're putting yourself under condemnation or because somebody, somebody through their religious tradition or whatever else is putting you under condemnation, you're going to be back like Paul thinking you're still the chief of what? Sinners, and you're going to be trying to overcome those things based upon your own ability. And you know what? It ain't going to work. Okay? But what will work? What will working in you allow you to overcome that? It is God's grace. It's the life of Christ. It's the new heart relationship that you have with God Almighty. His life is already there if you're a believer. Now I understand, you're like, well, I don't believe that. Well, that's what it says. Right? 
So again, the truth of who you are is running out ahead of where your mind is. So what we need to do as believers is remind ourselves every day of who we actually are and who we've actually been made to be. And let the life... The, go, to, uh, go, to, go to Ephesians 1. I had about four more verses here about the heart and Paul's epistles that we're not going to have time for. Ephesians 1, verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Now look at this verse. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us word who believe. You understand what that means? That means that you as a believer have the ability to tap into the exceeding great power. Whatever power that is that he's talking about. How's that verse end? According to the working of his what? Mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. You understand that the life of Christ in you allows you the capacity to tap into the same spiritual power that was exercised when the Lord, when God Almighty raised His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, from the dead? That's what it says. That's what it says. You believe that that's what it says. Do you believe that? Because... If you don't believe it, or you think, well, he's talking about somebody else. Can't be me. Look what I've done. You're leaving all of that power in your life on the table. That's what you're doing. You know, we live in Michigan, right? And a lot of people, a lot of people in Michigan suffer from seasonal depression. Don't have enough vitamin D. So they go, to, they go on spring break and they lay in the sun, right? And when they lay in the sun physically, what does it do for you? It makes you happy. It recharges your batteries, right? Correct? If you do it too long, you might have a negative consequence uh, as far as getting burned, right? But the point is, is there something that happens for you physically when you are exposing yourself to the sun? Yes, right? You know what you need to do? You need to do some spiritual sunbathing. That's what we need to do. We need to bathe ourselves in the reality of who God the Son is and who He's made us to be in Christ. And we need to believe and accept that the power, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is in us, the same spiritual power, the same ability, it's in us, and that's what takes the chief of sinners and makes him the apostle of the Gentile. It's not Paul's effort. It's not Paul's ability to manage his flesh. It's not Paul's ability to control his flesh, to try real hard. No. It's a realization that Christ's life is in him, and that when Christ's life is manifest in him, that stuff that he was thinking about, it's not even an issue anymore. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that it's just like that simple, right? Because you're, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against what? The flesh. But the point is, the power is in you already. You just have to believe what God's Word says. And when we believe what God's Word says, does that Word effectually work in us that believe? Go to, go to 1 Thessalonians. See, what religion wants to do is it wants to manage your outward behavior. But it doesn't do anything to reach in and change the cause of that what? Behavior. Look, you got to understand, the doctrine, the truth, the reality is so far ahead of where our thinking is. But just because, I, just because I can't really wrap my mind around that right now doesn't mean that what the verse says isn't true. 
Okay? Where did I tell you to go? 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that what? Believe. So if you're looking to your spouse, if you're looking to your children, if you're looking to another family member to be your source of sufficiency, I'm sorry, but you're going, to be mis- you're, going to be, you're going to be disappointed every time. Because you're asking those people to do things for you that, you that they can't do. The only place that you are going to find unconditional love and acceptance is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we learn today, lo and behold, that He's already in your heart, that His Spirit already dwells within you, that you've already had a heart transplant and a change of position and a change. And and so what we need to do is we need to recalibrate our thinking to line up with who we actually are and what that Word actually says. And when we do, you know what will be manifest in you? The life of Christ. It wasn't just about the dispensational theology. That, God, that, that Christ appeared to Saul of Tarsus. It wasn't just about the mystery. It wasn't just about the dispensation of grace. It wasn't just about all that. That's all great stuff, important stuff, needful stuff. But it was about Christ revealing Himself in Paul. That's what it was about also. And now, the, the opportunity is there for the same thing to happen with us. So go back, we'll close in 1 Corinthians. 15. <laughs> See, there, that's a life that grace provides. Grace is not just theological gymnastics that you do with the Bible. That's important. You need to rightly divide. Okay, We need to understand who our apostle is and who we are and what dispensation we're in and all that. That's all important stuff. But the reason that's important is because it leads to a life that is lived on the basis of understanding who and what you are. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. But the life, or I'm sorry, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. You know what religion wants to do? I said this before and I'll say it again. At Christmas time, my wife makes these sugar cookies. And there's these cookie cutters. And you you spread the dough out and you stick that thing on the dough. And guess what you get? You get whatever that shape is. That's what religion wants to do. Religion wants to stamp everybody into the same mold. You know what grace says? Grace says you're free. And let's just see what the life of Christ and Brad, how the life of Christ and Brad manifests itself, and how the life of Christ and Ernie manifests itself, and how the life of Christ and Brian manifests itself. And it's not trying to put everybody into the same mold and spit out the same output. It's set. Now, the life of Christ in me is going to have certain characteristics as it will in Brad, as it will in Ernie, but it will be Christ's life in Ernie. It will be Christ's life in Brad. It will be Christ's life in me. And it's going to be different. It's going to be unique. It's going to be distinct. Because it's me. It's not Brad. It's not Ernie. And vice versa. And it was the grace of God that took the chief of sinners and made him into the apostle of the Gentiles. So don't think that grace is just about salvation. It is, and it's wonderful. It's great. It's the best thing ever to know that you're saved by grace through faith plus nothing. Don't think that grace is just about the dispensational theological gymnastics. That's great too. It's needed. You need to understand it. But what you also need to get is that grace is fundamentally a life that you live. It's tough, man, when you're dealing with your kids and they're doing stuff that's stupid. Because the flesh in you just wants to lower the hammer on them. Just wants to grind it. You know what, you know what I'm saying, those of you that are parents? Especially when they're teenagers, like mine. 
Okay? It's not easy, but how does God parent us? Does God save you from the consequence of your dumb choice? No. If I'm going to do something crazy, go out here and do something dumb, is God going to intervene and say, oh, I'm going to make sure that nothing bad happens to you? No. Grace is freedom and responsibility with consequences. If you're going to sow to the flesh, you're going to, of the flesh, reap what? Corruption. If you're going to sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap what? Life everlasting. But the reality is, as thou as a believer, you have the choice not to sow to the flesh. You have the ability, you have the power, you have the capacity not to do that because who's in you? Christ. Before you were saved, you had no other choice. You didn't know how to do anything else. That's why when you get saved, you, you still struggle with some of that stuff. Because that stuff became your fleshly coping mechanism for how you were going to deal with life. Right? And now that you're saved, it's not like all that stuff's just like, whoop, gone. But what is different is now you have an internal power source that when you tap into it by faith in what God says, has the ability for you to actually live godly in Christ Jesus. And no religious domination, no religious system, no per system of works-based acceptance and performance is going to do that for you. All it's going to do is manifest time and time and time again your ability to fail. There's a reason why Paul became... i, I got to stop, okay? You get the point. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We pray that we'll get a hold of the truth of grace, not just as a theological system, not just as a, not just as a methodology of, of, of justification, but also as a life to be lived. We're grateful for the opportunity that we can have to study these things, to preach these things. We pray that we will, by faith, believe these things. And when we do, the Word will work effectually in us. We're grateful for the time that we could spend together in Your Word this morning. In Christ's name, Amen.